and it's going to be a hot one here in New York. Yeah, again, again, <laughs> we, not walking home when, again. <laughs> what Seattle is feeling, we're now uh, getting a little we taste of here. We absolutely are. It's certainly hot in the city, and that's where we begin today with those blistering hot temperatures across the country. Millions of people are under heat advisories as we head into another day of potentially record heat. Sweltering weather is blanketing the country from coast to coast as the Northwest gets out of one of the most extreme heat waves on record. The Northeast is now dealing with temps in the 90s and triple digits. That includes Philadelphia, where we find Randy Gyllenhaal from our NBC station, WCAU. And Randy, it could feel more like 100 degrees in Philly today. How are people there dealing with the heat? Yeah, hot once again. It's uh, been days like this, as you mentioned, and it's going to be a scorcher today. Feels like temperatures above 100 degrees in the city, and that's creating a bit of a heat island effect in Philadelphia, which has so much asphalt. We're live this morning along Philadelphia's historic Boathouse Row. People walking maybe a little bit slower this morning. And check it out, the Schuylkill River over here. Uh, these rowers are going to be sweating a lot harder today because once the sun really comes up, the heat wave is going to reach brutal temperatures. Call it hot town summer in the city. Philadelphia is scorching. Even SEPTA, our bus system, using some of their buses as cooling centers, welcoming people on board. Uh, we got those Mr. Frosty trucks selling the ice cream. Ice cream sales are surging. But really, the only way you can stay cool in this kind of weather is either going inside into the air conditioning, seeing a lot of people staying home, going to shopping malls and other indoor activities, or finding some water. But that is a bit harder for city kids. Uh, you can't really swim in the river here. And we have had some issues with pools being closed. Those are reopening today for the first time in a while. Yeah, Randy, can you tell us a little more about the pool situation? Obviously, that's a great way to beat the heat, especially if you don't have air conditioning, but not all the city pools were open in Philadelphia. So what was going on there? Yeah, it's been uh, two years since they've been open. Last year, of course, they were all closed due to COVID. That was a hot summer, too. This year, about 70 percent of those pools will reopen. It's great for some of these neighborhoods that don't have somewhere else to cool off. Uh, but the reason that number is lower is because Philadelphia, in addition to places on the Jersey Shore and really all over the country, facing that ongoing lifeguard shortage, they've even raised their salary to more than $15 an hour, but still can't get enough people to bite. So here in Philly and really all around the country, we are seeing staff shortages, lifeguard shortages, making it more hard uh, for people to cool off in the city. All right, Randy, stay as cool as you possibly can. Reporting for our NBC station in Philadelphia. Thanks so much. <laughs> How long is it all going to last? Let's get a check on that extreme weather being felt across the country this morning. When it might end. Hi, Bill. Good morning. Here we are talking about this yet again. Hey, good morning. I know, right? Uh, and yesterday wasn't your normal average heat in the Northeast. It was an exceptionally hot day uh, in Boston, for instance. It hit 99 degrees at Logan Airport. That was the hottest in nine years. So that's pretty significant. It hit 102 at Newark Airport. And it was the warmest day in New York City in about a year. Hartford, it was 99 yesterday. So, yeah, it was exceptionally hot. And this is just the temperature. The humidity made it feel like 100 to about 110. So where are we starting this morning? Well, it didn't cool off that much at all last night. It's still 85 degrees to start the morning in Central Park. Same with Boston. So when you're starting at 85, you know we're heading up to probably a heat index around 105 later this afternoon. And here's the deal. 43 million people under heat advisories. We do have the people from Philadelphia. A good chunk of New Jersey just outside of New York City is under excessive heat warnings. That's where we expect it to be a little more dangerous today. And as far as how hot will it get, very similar to yesterday. Many of the big cities will be between 95 and maybe 98 degrees today. The heat index will be up there about 100 to 105 at the peak of the afternoon. But what's different about today is that we get the thunderstorms later this afternoon, this evening. They'll be welcome in the way that they'll cool the atmosphere off. Everyone will love that, but they could bring severe weather with them. In that little area of darker shaded in the middle of the yellow there, that area from Albany right along the Mass Pike to Boston has a chance of actually significant severe storms, possibly even a few tornadoes later on today. As far as the rest of the country goes, we're still hot in areas of the West. It's just not quite as bad, guys, as it was. 103 in Boise, but Seattle's at 82. And then tomorrow, Kind of a back to normal type weather map, numerous areas dealing with some summer rain, but we don't have that really exceptional heat anywhere in the nation. Hmm. All right. Normal has never sound so nice. Yeah, really <laughs> some relief. Finally. I know, right? <laughs> Thanks, Bill. See you next hour. 
This morning marks the seventh day since the Surfside condo collapse and dozens of families are clinging to hope and waiting for answers about missing loved ones. City officials now say that 12 people are confirmed dead and 149 are still unaccounted for. President Biden and the First Lady are set to visit Surfside on Thursday. NBC News correspondent Antonia Hilton joins us now from Surfside, Florida. Antonia, good morning. So we know that many of these rescue workers at this site are highly experienced. What are they saying about the challenges they're facing in sifting through the rubble here? What is it like at this specific site? And are they still hopeful they can find survivors? Good morning, Savannah. Look, it is an incredibly challenging and agonizing process here as we stretch toward this seventh day. And they're averaging recently finding about one body a day, as you mentioned, bringing the death toll to 12. But the number of unaccounted for stands still at 149, which has been really overwhelming for both officials, workers and community members here to process. And to put this work in context, you know, yesterday I got to get up closer to the rubble site than I have in past days. And I also got to speak to someone who has worked at the site every single day. And what you see and what you hear is that there has been a pancaking effect with mm -hmm. this building, which means that unlike with other disasters, there aren't these open crevices where workers can easily move through and where bodies or survivors would be able to survive. And that's part of why people think they haven't found survivors now for several days, because the building has essentially each floor collapsed one after another flat on top of each other. And, you know, there's this growth tension here between the desire for optimism, the hope that a miracle is going to happen and another survivor is going to be found, and community members who are saying to these workers and to politicians, please be honest with us. You know, mm. if the reality is that our loved ones are very likely, you know, dead or that we're only going to receive body parts of our loved ones, we want to mm. start moving forward with the grieving process. We want closure. And this is just, you know, so painful to watch play out here, frankly, on the ground. And It'll be interesting to see when President Biden arrives tomorrow how that maybe shifts the tone because he talks so openly about his grief. He is often empathetic mm. when he sits down with families that have lost loved ones. It'll be interesting to see if his presence here shifts some of the tone more toward that grieving process uh, since so much has been focused on rescue recently, Savannah. Oh, it's just so heartbreaking to think about what those families are going through and how many questions that they have. Of course, the big question here is how is it possible that this happened? The Miami Herald is actually reporting that a pool contractor took photos of structural damage two days before the collapse that he seemed to think was alarming. What did he see? What did he tell the Herald? That's right. And that Miami Herald reporting has intensified the conversation, the scrutiny here as family members look toward accountability. How did this happen? And many of them are seeking to hold the leadership of that South Tower, the condo association, responsible for what they may or may not have known about the condition of the building in the months and in the hours ahead of this, because those photos were taken about 36 hours before this collapse wow. happened. And what they show is extensive standing water corrosion. And it's in an area that that's around the pool deck. And I brought this reporting and these photos to an expert engineer named Troy Morgan, who's at Exponent, and asked him to kind of break down for me the seriousness of what's seen in the Miami Herald's reporting. Mm -hmm. And he basically said that it's an interesting clue about damage that we may find out is within other parts of the building, but it's not yet the smoking gun that fully explains why this building came down. It's going to be months before we understand fully what was going on in the South Tower, Savannah. And Antonio, we also heard from the mayor of Surfside saying that they've received $1.9 million through this website, supportsurfside.org. How are county officials working to support these families? What's that money for? What kind of support are they receiving? That's been so heartening to see here in Surfside. There is a complete community mobilization, not just in Surfside, in greater Miami, and actually from really around the country. Mm -hmm. People are giving support to family members and to workers in every way that you can imagine. I mean, food, free food, constantly for everyone who is here grieving or here working around the clock. There are also mental health services, actually quite close to where I am right now. They're going to be doing mental health counseling for veterans connected to this crisis, and there are constant supplies of clothing and and uh, religious counseling for people who need everything from literal financial support to just personal day to day support right now. Savannah. Mm, absolutely. We had somebody on our show yesterday who said, if you pray, now's the time to pray. Antonia, thank you so much.
Questions about what brought the structure down have only intensified with each passing day. A letter obtained by NBC News shows that the condo board president warned residents of deteriorating conditions in April of this year. That letter was first reported by USA Today. We want to bring in Wendy Rhodes, the senior politics and economy reporter at USA Today, who has been covering this story. So, Wendy, thanks for being with us. First of all, what more can you tell us about the assessment the condo board made in this letter? Sure. So, um, initially, it looks like they were going to make an assessment of about $9 million. And then, and that was after the, the uh, inspection in 2018. As time passed and uh, the damages to the building continued to get worse and worse over time, as they do, and as, as the board pointed out, were exponential as time passed, um, just between 2018 and 2021, that assessment went from $9 million to about $15 million. Um, and that was for damages uh, to the roof. Uh, to the area under the pool, to the balconies, to the facade, to some of the waterproofing. And the residents were uh, were supposed to start paying those assessments actually in July, um, just, just days after the building collapsed is when the first assessments were due to start being collected to begin these repairs, which were going to take a significant amount of time to complete. Now you've also reported that a town building official had a very different assessment back in 2018. What did he say? Yeah. So um, he actually met with the board and told them that the building was was in very good condition and reassured them that everything was OK. Um, and I think that that's been a really big concern to people because the inspection report clearly um, disputes that. Um, and also my understanding is that building official now is a contractor for a nearby city of Doral and has been put on leave. But we haven't been able to actually speak with him yet. Um, but it's certainly concerning that a report could show that much damage, that severe damage, and, and basically say that, that the building was in danger of, of imminent failure in, in several respects and then tell the residents that, yeah, certainly seems to be in contrast with what those reports were saying. Now, Wendy, I know you've also been speaking extensively with city and county officials there. How has this operation been going so far from their perspective? Well, the city and county officials, as well as the state officials, have, have been very, very proud of how they've handled this. Um, they say that it's it's meticulous and slow, but that it's being done correctly and for the safety of any potential survivors that are still underground, as well as the rescue crew. Um, certainly, there's, there's families and uh, friends of loved ones that have complained that it's that it's going too slow. And you can imagine the absolute agony that you're in um, if you fear that somebody you love is buried under the rubble and that and that rescuers are moving slow. But but I do believe that officials are on top of this. I do believe that they're doing everything they could do in, in the most safe possible. Right. And they're also providing emotional and mental support, which I think is really huge, not only to the families, but to the first responders. You know, the first responders, as well as the families, are at risk of long-term PTSD from something like this. And even the first responders have access to mental health care between their shifts. So um, there's certain counselors and religious leaders with the families at all times. So they're really making sure that people have the support that they need right now. And then going forward, I think the big question is going to be, why did this happen and how can we prevent it from happening again? So they're going to be looking at changing uh, building laws, changing ordinances, changing codes to ensure that not only this doesn't happen again, but other buildings that are around that are at similar risk are retrofitted immediately. Such an important point about mental health there. This has been a dramatic experience for mm -hmm. so many people. Wendy, thank you so much for your reporting. Appreciate it. The Delta variant is gaining ground in the U.S. with cases more than doubling every two weeks. It's also spurring mixed messages about mask wearing that's catching many of the 154 million fully vaccinated Americans off guard. 
The World Health Organization says vaccinated people should wear masks again. Now, health officials in Los Angeles are echoing that same message, recommending everyone in that city keep their masks on. These new recommendations contradict the CDC guidance that says fully vaccinated people can go mask free in most situations. NBC News health and medical reporter Erica Edwards is here with the latest. Erica, good morning. All right. So what's with the CDC saying this and then the World Health Organization saying something else? I mean, this confusion over masks, we've obviously seen this so many times throughout this virus. But what does this mean? Hey, Savannah, good morning. So right now, there's no indication that the CDC is about to make any changes to its mask guidance, which basically says that fully vaccinated people can safely go without masks even indoors. Now, that was that kind of guidance was praised when the agency released it back in March, especially among critics who were upset with you know what they called vague and confusing messaging mm-hmm. on masking. And last night, Dr. Fauci said, address the mask debate and said that some people may still need to wear masks. As a country, the CDC feels we do not need to make any change in the recommendation now because of the efficacy and effectiveness of the vaccines. Now, to be sure, Lester, there will be some people, they could be elderly or people who have underlying conditions who are vaccinated, if they are in a region in which there's a high level of infection, they may choose on their own opinion, which I think is totally reasonable, and that's fine, to say, I want that extra bit of protection. Savannah, I talked with three doctors last night in states where Delta variant is rapidly um, spreading, all strongly encourage us to keep wearing those masks, even fully vaccinated, Savannah. So Eric, of course, as this Delta variant's taking hold here in the country, people who are vaccinated are wondering, am I safe? Moderna's saying its vaccine holds up well against the Delta variant. We've also heard about a doctor who I think followed up the J&J vaccine with a dose of Pfizer. What's going on here with the mRNA vaccines versus J&J, especially as we talk in the context of the Delta variant? Sure. Well, you know, first of all, with the Moderna had a study out yesterday that was promising news that its vaccine is quite effective, although it was a very small study uh, based on just eight people after they were vaccinated. So it really might not reflect real world efficacy. That said, these vaccines do continue to work very, very well. And a lot of experts are saying that they are still worthy um, and protective, even if the effectiveness comes down slightly because of those variants. Mm -hmm. All right, Erica, thank you so much. As the U.S. investigation into the origins of the coronavirus continues, new reporting by NBC News has found ties between a leading researcher at China's Wuhan lab and military scientists. NBC's senior international correspondent Keir Simmons has more. This week, more than 30 international scientists say China should not be allowed to block a full inquiry into the origins of the coronavirus. We can't just give China a veto over whether or not we investigate the most terrible pandemic in a century. In January, a Trump administration fact sheet accused China of secret military activity at a lab in Wuhan. Former State Department advisor David Asher helped write that fact sheet. I'm very confident that the military was funding a secret program that it did involve coronaviruses. I heard this from several foreign researchers who observed uh, researchers in that lab uh, in the military lab coats. A leading researcher at the Wuhan Institute of Virology, Dr. Shi Zheng Li, insists it's only a civilian institution. She was questioned this year by Jamie Metzel, a former national security official. At the beginning of the COVID-19, we heard the rumors that in this, uh, it claimed that in our laboratory, we have some project, blah, blah, with the army, blah, blah, this kind of rumors. But this is not correct. But NBC News has evidence Dr. Xi herself has multiple connections with military officials. She and others collaborated with a military scientist on coronavirus research in spring 2018. And with another military scientist, Zhou Yusen, in December 2019. In fall 2020, an article that scientist authored lists him in a footnote as deceased. NBC has been unable to ascertain the circumstances of his death. 
The State Department has repeatedly raised concerns over China's compliance with the Biological Weapons Convention. Questions over China's transparency now central to President Biden's coronavirus inquiry. Savannah, Joe. Hey, NBC News viewers, thanks for checking out our YouTube channel. Subscribe by clicking on that button down here and click on any of the videos over here to watch the latest interviews, show highlights, and digital exclusives. Thanks for watching.